You follow me? And so you tell yourself you're happy to be alone because you can actually be yourself. But what would even be better for you is to be in a partnership where you, where you feel you can't be yourself and actually start being yourself. Confront that emotionally. Does that make sense? Yeah. And when you do that, you'll then be able to create a relationship where not only are you happy being yourself, but because you're being yourself, you create ex you've attracted a, a person in your life who is exactly allowing you to be yourself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, are you really happy being alone? Well, I, I'm not real. I'm in a relationship. Yeah, but a feeling. It's, it's a yeah, feeling. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not. No, no, because there's a feeling that in the relationship, and this is why in the relationships you've kept distance. Mm. Because in a relationship, every time you get into one, that you feel drawn. It's a, it's a childhood emotion about your mother. You feel drawn, like pulled into doing things that they want you to do and not, not actually doing what you want to do. And you feel like you must do that to maintain peace and maintain harmony. And, and that gets you away from yourself and that feels terrible yeah. when you're away from yourself. I mean, it feels good though. It feels good position. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's much better to be yourself and not be in a relationship than be in a relationship sometimes and not be yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But what would be even better is to be yourself, no matter whether you're in a relationship or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you will trigger all the emotions inside of you that cause you in a relationship to withdraw from yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how many of you find that in your relationships? When you buy yourself, you're yourself. But when you're in the relationship, you modify yourself to suit. Yeah. So some people do that, right? So if that's the case, allow yourself to work through that emotionally. Yeah. Right. So those three things. Everyone understands those things. Yeah. Does everyone feel like a break for a while? Yeah. Yeah. Ten minutes or so. I find normally we plan these for a couple of hours and they go five or whatever, but we'll just go until everyone's feeling a little tired and then we'll stop. And uh, normally I'm fairly sensitive, so I can feel when you're all feeling tired. <laughs> all right. What else do you want to ask? I'd like to know a bit more about soulmates. Yep. Who else wants to learn more about soulmates? A lot. Soulmates, my second favourite subject. What's your favourite subject? God. Yeah, my favourite subject is God. And yeah, definitely. My second favourite subject is my soulmate. <laughs> my soulmate, not yours. So here's God. God has masculine and feminine qualities. Remember. In the DVD you learned that the souls were created and each soul has masculine and feminine qualities and the soul separates into the two halves. And this is a part of that incarnation process. So you've got the masculine half with it. And I draw two bodies because one of them is a physical body and the other one's a spirit body. And then this is your soul. So that's the male part of the soul and then there's the female part of the soul. Hey Jake, can I just ask you a question at that point? Yeah. Is there ever um, just one soul, one uh, soul release at one time, or five, or two hundred, or? Um, when you say one soul release. Well, like when God makes a, a section of souls, are they all released at the one time? The instant God desires anything, it all happens. Right. Okay. So, so as soon as God desires to create, as soon as God desired to create souls, create children. In fact, that mm. we're all His mm. children. Yeah. So as soon as he desired to create children, all of a sudden all the children came into existence. Yeah. Now, they weren't conscious of their own existence at this point. So before they incarnate, they're not conscious of their own existence. They don't know who they are, they don't know how to experience themselves or anything anything like that, right? So at that point they're in a fairly in a pristine state, unconscious of themselves. They have to incarnate to become conscious of themselves. So the way they incarnate is one half of the soul incarnates first and then the other half. And the two halves, the first half will incarnate and the second half will stay attracted. But it doesn't know it's being attracted, but it stays attracted to the first half and follows it around until it incarnates. Right? So this is why often you find soulmates actually incarnating in the same country or the same city or 
things like that because they're often following around the other half of their soul. Didn't you say the parents choose the choose the soul though? Yep. The soul half. Yep. Yeah. And that what I've just said doesn't negate that. No. No. Remember, it's, it's, when the first half incarnates, that's yeah. due to the law of attraction surrounding yeah. parents. The second half is following around the first half, waiting for an opportunity to incarnate, and then the longing of other parents will have caused that incarnation. Oh, so it's a localised longing, you know, first come, stress, or yeah, first coming, best dress, or in, you know. Yeah, right. very similar to how the sperm is impregnates the egg, right? Very similar. There's certain things going on there, too. Law of attraction things. Yeah. yeah. Longings, yeah. Longings, yeah. yeah. All right, so we've both got material body, spirit body, and so forth, and then there's our soul. There's the real you. This is the real you. That's the real Real you has personality, desires, passions, longings, has intentions, and so forth, and that, and has memories too. And all of that is the real you. Sorry, buddy. In again, yeah. there was one question I wanted to ask you. Um, the souls themselves, before they uh, actually um, enter into the the, the uh, mother's womb or something like that, they actually have their own. Different set of personalities. They have personalities. So all those all those souls up there have got their got Unique their own personalities. Yeah. yeah, all of them. The whole spectrum of them. Yep. yep. And all of the personalities are completely different from each other. So how is that defined? Personality defined yeah. by God. God created. So He has this plan where He says, "Oh, that one, that one, that one," and that He determines the script of the life. No, no, don't don't interpret personality with will. Right. God has given you all free will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of you have total self-determination of your entire life in amongst the laws that God has created. Mm -hmm. Okay, So all of you have total self-determination. There is no such thing as predestiny aside from one destiny. You know what that is? Going back. Going back. Actually God. becoming at, eventually at one, one with God. God. Yes. Right? That was God's intention for you, but it doesn't mean it's your destiny. No. Why isn't it your destiny? Because Free you world. have a choice. Because you have a choice. Mm -hmm. So the choice you, is a choice you need to make, and this is why you need to long for divine love if you want that relationship with God. That's a choice you need to make. You do not have divine love in your soul when you're first created. You have your natural love in your soul that God gave you to express, but divine love, God's love, is not in your soul until you long for it. Mm -hmm. right. So what happens with people who are not capable or uh, of making choices? People with severe disabilities, intellectual disabilities? They are often like far more capable of making choices mm -hmm. than what we are. Mm -hmm. We have become intellectually dominant. So, for instance, um, you mind me mentioning how your, their daughter, a four-year-old child with uh, autism, I keep forgetting what it is, um, is in a much more pristine state from a soul condition and has many more longings towards God than most other people at that age. Because she has less emotional damage that causes the suppression of those longings. I'm talking about free will. Yeah. Remember, free will is at the soul level, not the intellectual level. Mm. So it's not got anything to do with the free will of the mind. It's got everything to do with the free will of your emotion. And she has emotion. Right? And those emotions are exercised in certain ways. Right? So a lot of people you classify as having intellectual disabilities have no emotional disability. Oh, I understand that. I've worked with them and I've got them in my family. So That's right. That. So those people with no emotional disability or less emotional disability even, they've shut down less of their emotions, so they have less emotional disability than ourselves in many cases. Right? And often they're in a more pristine state from God's perspective and, have, and are already exercising the longing of their soul in a far better place than many of us. So have. what's the difference between choice and free will? Um, free will means that you can make any choice. Choice is when you make the choice. So, like free, so for instance, uh, right at the moment, you had the free will to be here or any other place on earth. 
right? But you made the choice to be here. Let's say, let's say you get angry. Right at that moment you're angry, you have the free will to kill the person you're angry with. You do. And none of you have made that choice. <laughs> you have all made a different choice to not do that, you know, to, to stay away from taking that step. So choice is really fairly a bit different than free will yeah, in that regard. Getting back to the soulmate discussion though, because that was the question. So we understand that these are soulmates with each other. There's only one soulmate, one soulmate. So let's now ask the questions we want to ask about that relationship. What are they? What about twins? Are they soulmates? No, not not the moment. Except way way back in human history when there were very few people on the earth. That was potentially the case, but uh, it's never happened as far as I'm aware. Yeah, Even the, when these cells split in two, like some twins? Yeah, because remember that's just a physical process. Yeah. We're talking about the soul, yeah. not the physical yeah. process. Okay. The physical bodies are created at the time of conception. Yeah. They are not the soul. Yeah. There are many spirits, though, in this room who believe the, the spirit body is the soul. So that's a bit of a shock for them to learn that actually the soul is not the same as the spirit body. The spirit body is a body created at conception as well. So both of these bodies are created at conception. And if you could think of it conceptually, your soul surrounds them. Does that make sense? Your soul just and controls them totally. Controls every function physiologically, controls everything through emotion. And like desire. over. It, it, it surrounds them like over, three-dimensionally. Is there such a thing as space? Um, yes. Or, or is it just a concept that we have? Well, no, there is such a thing as space. Um, obviously, space, the concepts we have about space, are, you know, ob obviously very in their very primitive yeah, stage yeah. in terms of what space really is. Space can be compressed and it can be manipulated and all sorts of things can happen in space that we're not aware of at the moment as a race. But um, that's getting off the subject of the soul. Mate. So I'm probably still a little bit upset with it. Um, clairvoyance see auras of spiritual, is, is that the spiritual body or is that the, the soul? And the aura is actually the spirit body that they're seeing, that, which is the emanation of the soul coming through the spirit form. So, so, so what happens, in, if, you, if you were a spirit right now, what you would see when you're looking at everyone else here, is you would see their spirit body just like our bodies, just right now, but you would see them glow with certain colours, and different colours and different different colours in your body mean different emotions are still there within your body, and some emotions are pure and they have different colours than the emotions that are dark and dirty emotions. They have different things. So if you were looking at a person in the first sphere, who was maybe in the hills. You would see them with like a, in a grey, brown, dirty, mucky sort of colours. Right? As a person progresses, you start seeing cleaner colours with them and brighter colours. To eventually, they start getting into state of pearly white type colours or golden colours, and and then progress even further. And eventually, you get to the point where you can't even see their colour anymore because they're so developed, like in the twenty seconds period with the soul union. Is that like um? There's a book, Barbara and um, Brennan. Brennan, yeah. Where she draws the auras. Yes. Yes. Um, but it's a very her book is very focused around the spirit body yeah. being the soul. Yeah. yeah. So they talk about the different etheric layers of the spirit form, yes. and they are all what they call the emotional body, the intellectual body, <coughs> those kind of things. And yes, what you think is available as an aura to other people, what you feel inside of you is available to everyone else around you. It's just that they don't know how to access it just yet for most people on earth. But, but the truth is those things do exist, yeah. but they are all emanations of the soul that the spirit can't see. Yeah. And so a lot of the spirits are only describing what they can see and not what they can't see. All right, getting back to our soulmates. Soulmate questions, please. How do you know if you've met a real soulmate? Okay, good question. And most people don't, is the answer. Mm. The reason why they don't is, what do you reckon it might be? Emotional injuries. The emotional injuries. 
Yeah. So let's say, my, let's say I'm, I'm, you know, walking along the street, male, and my soulmate's walking in the other direction, and I've got an emotional injury that I need a woman to be four inches shorter than me before I find her attractive. A lot of men have got that injury, where they need the woman to be look smaller than themselves. And let's say the woman's walking along, thinking she needs the man to be four inches taller than her <laughs> to be attractive, right? Now, if she happens to be 5'7 and I happen to be 5'8, or what's that in centimetres, I don't know, 170 let's say, and 174, and what's going to happen? Nothing. I'll look at her, maybe, feel some kind of connection, but go, no, 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 she's too short, or she's too tall, or he's too short, right? And walk on by. Just one little emotional injury <laughs> caused me just to walk past my soulmate. Right. Do you meet that soulmate again? Again, like the fish going around the... Uh, you may do, you may do. <laughs> you may do. You well, certainly you will you over your life. Else, yeah. So if you include your life as being a spirit world life as well, you will certainly come up with the soul. So you get a second chance. Yeah, many soulmates. I've, I've seen soulmates introduced to each other even in the spirit world and they've taken one look at each other and just gone in the opposite direction. They've just said, no, that's not my soulmate. Not that kind. And then like a hundred years later, realised that, oh, that he one. was actually. <laughs> so what is a soul connection? I suppose you could ask. A lot of people think, oh, I've got this wonderful sexual connection going on with this person. I just feel blown away sexually by this person. That is not necessarily a soulmate connection. The reason why is that I could have this really... Uh, sexual connection is about first and second chakras, right, in the body. Now, I could, have, I could have a really severe emotional injury in myself as a male where I feel like drawn to women who want to have power over me. Right? Who am I going to be sexually attracted to? A woman who wants to have power over me. Mm. So I'll feel a strong sexual connection with her. Doesn't mean she's my soulmate. All it means is that our emotional injuries that cause the awakening of my sexual impulse are compatible. And the more compatible, the stronger the sexual desire. But it doesn't mean the person's my soulmate. And I might find that when I heal that injury within myself, that same person I find totally unattractive. Mm. So, can you see how important it is to feel my own opposite sex emotional injuries? It's very, very important. So how do I recognise my soulmate then? Like, well it's very, very hard if I've got lots of emotional injuries towards the opposite sex. Very hard. And that's why I say, like, be honest about these emotional injuries you feel towards the opposite sex. Really get into them and allow yourself to experience them and work your way through them because if you don't, you firstly will never be complete for yourself. So it's an Second. obligation really, you have to be on the half of yourself, isn't it? Really it is. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, and it's perfect. When you think about it, the way God created it is pretty clever, eh? Yeah. Mm. To you, be whole and complete. To be whole and complete with yeah. your own self, yeah. mm. which right. means the two of these being you need together, the other half. you're going to need the other half, which means that you're going to need to be dedicated to dealing with yeah. all of your injuries with the yeah. other half. Yeah. Mm. And so did I. And so do they. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing about the soulmate attraction is if one of you make the choice to deal with all of your emotional mm. injuries about the other half, the other half will automatically be drawn into your life. Yeah. Even if you were born in another country? Even if you were born in another country. And left when you were very young. Sorry? And you left when you were very young. So. Yep. Yeah. That soulmate could come after you or before you? That, yep, and they'll be drawn, if you deal with your stuff, they'll be drawn some for some reason to a certain place. Like, my, in this, in this, I don't know, what do you want, my first century life or this one? Um, I can give you an illustration of both Thanks, you know, with regard Thanks. to soulmate. Um, let's look at the first century life. Um, as I was growing up, I started and I cleared out all of these emotional injuries with the opposite settings, right? What happened was that I, f I, I felt like no sexual attraction to anyone. So I got to the point where I didn't feel sexually attracted, and this was in my teenage years, didn't feel sexually attracted to anyone I met. And, uh, and that just continued 
for the next quite a few years. It was nearly 15 years like that. Where I wasn't sexually attracted to everyone. So I was attracted to everyone in terms of loving everyone, but not sexually attracted. What happened was that as I got myself into an alignment condition with God, and I went in through that process, then I began my what I what I've now call my public ministry, where I started talking to people about what the truth was that I'd gone through myself. Now, as in during that phase, I attracted the woman in, from a town. My soulmate was in a town that I probably would never have visited before then for any reason other than me wanting to teach the truth. Mm. Right? And because I visited that town, I met her. And as soon as I met her, I knew she was my soulmate. Now she didn't know. She didn't know she was my soulmate at the time. But I knew. And I didn't tell her. Because I wanted her to come to the realisation herself. Right? As to what was going on. But she felt very attracted to me. Not because of me being a man she would normally be attracted to. But because she was more attracted to men who would, um, who would make her feel secure and make her feel financially secure and so forth. That's what she was more attracted to. And of course I didn't have much funds and, and I was going around and saying I was a messiah, which meant I probably had a short lifespan and things yeah. like that, right? <laughs> so, you know, initially she, she would not have normally been attracted to a man like that. But she felt drawn to the message and to the message of truth and that caused her to deal with some of her emotions and then she realised that I was probably her soulmate. She had some, a lot of issues to work through about that, just like uh, many of us do when we, when we meet our soulmate. Now, when you meet your soulmate, what starts happening then is every single emotional injury left within yourself is going to be triggered even more when you meet your soulmate than it would be with any other person. The reason why your soulmate connection is connecting you on all the chakra levels, all the energy, but not just the chakras, like the seven, but all of the energy points that are going on in your whole body are, are about the actual energy connection with your soulmate, the emotional connection with your soulmate. So you imagine when you meet them, all of a sudden, all of these things start going on that you, you know, that that start really surprising you and confronting you, and it's going to be very confronting for most of you emotionally when you meet your soulmate if you haven't already, right, from a, from an emotional perspective. So it's not like, oh, meet your soulmate, all your dreams come true, I'll walk off in there. Not like that, because you've got all of your emotional errors that are being confronted consistently. So let's go forward to this century. For me, I became, I've, been, I've had this feeling or longing for my soulmate all my life. I can remember walking around when I was four years old, holding a girl's hand, <laughs> thinking about my soulmate, right? So that's been something that's been all my life. Now, I, because of my emotional injuries, I attracted three relationships in my life. And, and every single one of those relationships, I felt at some point they were my soulmate. And then as I worked through some emotional injuries, I realised, no, they're not. Right. Then I got my state, self into a state, and this was uh, nearly six years ago now, where I said to myself, I, I don't want to have another relationship unless it's my soulmate. Right. And so what I decided to do then was focus on dealing with all of my unhealed emotional injuries with the opposite sex through the law of attraction. So whatever women would be attracted into my life uh, doesn't age immaterial. From a child to an older lady, I would actually allow myself to feel what they're triggering within me and work my way through those issues emotionally. Uh, beginning with my mother, uh, where a lot of the issues reside. And so I allow myself to do that over the next five years. So I remain single and celibate for that time, uh, just dealing with all of those emotions. Still, and all that time, my longing for my soulmate was growing, of course, because I, as I released a new emotion, that meant I would have more capacity to actually long for and love my soulmate. And so my longing grew. And then I, and I had this feeling for all that time that I needed to move to Queensland. If I lived in South Australia, I felt I needed to go to Queensland. So, so I moved to Queensland. And unbeknown to me, in the time between looking at Queensland and moving to Queensland, 
because of my desire to begin teaching the truth again, so it happened in a similar way to, for me than it happened in the first century, because of that desire building, I actually met my soulmate's parents in one of these kind of groups that we had up there. And I didn't know at the time, and she was overseas, my soulmate was overseas in Lebanon, of all places. And Lebanon wasn't a place that I was thinking of visiting. <laughs> And uh, she wasn't thinking of coming home either. She was in a relationship with somebody else. And, uh, and then I had some really strong emotions come up about maybe losing my soulmate even. And right at that moment, unbeknown to me, she was considering marrying this man that she was with in Lebanon. And then within a week, that relationship had broken. And uh, within a month, she came home to Australia. So. My longing for my soulmate caused all of these different events mm -hmm. right, to occur automatically without my knowing. And I only found out about them afterwards. And then uh, her parents, because they, they were going to these groups, they wanted me to meet her. So, so it wasn't, they, didn't try to, they weren't trying to set me up with her. In fact, they felt quite the opposite. They, they wanted to, uh, and they still feel quite the opposite actually. Um, <laughs> They wanted to, you know, just just have us meet because what, what had been happening for them is that they'd been receiving all this truth that you're receiving now, and being really quite fascinated, and they wanted their, both of their children, their son and their daughter, to, to meet me, and they both met me on the same day. Now, again, the instant I saw her, <laughs> I realised who she was because I was at that stage had dealt with lots of different emotions. And it wasn't looking at a picture, it wasn't anything to do with her face or how pretty she is or any of those kind of things. It was all just to do with some, some feelings that I could feel just look, looking in her eyes actually. And it just, I, I just came to realise that this, the, the feelings that I could get from this soul, if you like, mm -hmm. were totally different to all of the other feelings that I felt from any other person. And some of them were sexual, which was the first time that had happened for the previous five years. And that had never happened before. And so I knew straight away she was my soulmate, but she didn't realise because of her, what she was going through, a breakup, a relationship, and lots of anger issues with uh, men. Or well, not so much anger issues, but frustration issues with men and so forth she was working through. And uh, it was only much later again than that that she started to understand what was going on herself. Did you tell her you'd broken up the relationship? <laughs> no. Well, it wasn't me that broke it up. Obviously, it was her desire too. Yes, I One thing that she had said uh, a month before she met me, after she had broken up with her previous partner, she longed for a, a man in her life who was spiritually inclined. And she wanted a complete relationship with him, sexually, emotionally, physically and all those kind of things. Like, and a month later I rocked up mm -hmm. uh, from her exercising that. So it was a combination of desires. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now that all being said, when we get together, when we met, um, her first emotion towards me was one of deep anger. And the reason why was because one of the core emotions within her was that in the first century when I died, she felt that I chose to die, which I did. And, uh, and she felt really, really angry and upset with me about leaving her. Mm. And so she couldn't understand, but she just had this deep rage towards me <laughs> when she met me. Now, if I was in a state where I was, you know, really upset with women's anger and everything like that, I would have, of course, just said, well, I won't go on there, right? Mm. And I would have just walked away from that. But because I, still owning my own emotions, I had to own all of my own emotions, so for the first few times we met, I'd go home and I had a big cry actually about you know how my soulmate felt about me. I knew she was my soulmate, but I also could feel how she was feeling. So does it make sense to you that that you know in fact when I met her, she brought up so many emotions within myself still that I had not connected with that I spent the next month and a half going through some pretty severe emotions. Then we actually, she caught up with me while I was overseas and we had a short period of time together but then lots of emotions came up for her and for me 
And so we separated for a time, nearly three months. And uh, it's only recently again that we've got back together, and I don't know how long for. But I feel this time that it'll be a more permanent thing because we now both have the desire, those three things that we were, I was talking about before. We're now both in a humble place. We're now both looking for God's truth, and we're now both looking for God's love. So because of that, there's a higher, higher likelihood things will just keep developing now. Is she now aware that she's your soulmate and vice versa? Um, yeah, she she feels that she's probably my soulmate. Mm -hmm. is probably the best way to put it. She's having lots of memories about the first century, and she's of course, you know, naturally, if you're having memories about the first century with a life with this man who's yeah. standing in front of you, then of course, you know, that's bringing up lots of confirmation for yeah. her about yeah. who she is. Yeah. But there's a lot of big picture issues too to face for all for each of the 14 who have returned. So, you know, there's very confronting emotionally. You know, you know how hard it is to deal with your own emotions, right? Imagine for a moment now that you've got to deal with 2,000 years of it. And then you start understanding to a degree what's involved with this process that the 14 are going through. So, soulmate attraction, the best thing to do to attract your soulmate is to work on your own emotions about the opposite gender. Right? Or, and, don't, and don't assume that what I'm saying is that um, there's no <coughs> such thing as a lesbian soulmate couple or a, homo or a homosexual soulmate couple. Because the truth is that at least 10% of soulmate couples are either lesbian or homo homosexual couples. And it's the way the soul split that controls that. Right? So again, but the same issue is still, feel your own emotions, deal with all the things about the opposite gender. Right? Because they are all stuff to work through, and about your own gender, of course, too. Right? So deal with gender-based emotional injuries, in other words. So if you're a male, deal with how you feel about yourself as a man, and deal with how you feel about women. If you're a female, deal with how you feel about yourself as a woman, and deal with how you feel about men work through those emotions. When you do that, you will attract your soulmate. Many of you will find perhaps that you're with your soulmate. <laughs> Already. And that often does happen. Right? Most people meet their soulmates on earth, and many people historically have married them. They're just not aware of it even on earth. It's only when they pass in the spirit world they realise that they were soulmates. The soulmate relationship you can get together with your soulmate and not have a soulmate relationship. Remember a soulmate relationship is going to be a relationship where you connect on every level energetically. Now if you've got an injury, say in the second chakra area about unworthiness, are you going to be able to connect in that area? Obviously not. You see a lot of soulmates on earth connecting in friendship areas or love areas from the heart, but not sexually. You see that happening quite a lot because of the sexual injuries they have. So they connect as friends and they feel really drawn to that person. They can't sort of be away from that person for very long. They feel really drawn. But they're not connection, connecting sexually because of some sexual injuries. You follow me? Mm. So you see that happening quite a lot. Where, uh, and you see other ones where they're connecting sexually but they're not connecting mm. in their heart and they're not connecting with truth and they're not connecting in, the fear, mm. in their fear, you know, the, the opposite to fear, you know, where, where you don't really feel this way, they're not connected there. So they're just connecting in the sexual way. You see that happening a lot too. So the key is to just deal with all of those injuries and that will attract your soulmate to you. Now the soulmate relationship is going to be a very, very close relationship. It's, in fact, it's going to get so close for you that you will know exactly what they're thinking and feeling at any time and they will know exactly what you're thinking and feeling at any time. You will be totally emotionally and intellectually naked to each other. That's a bit scary thought sometimes. Mm -hmm. Think about that. For some of you, that's a very scary thought perhaps. But that's how the soulmate relationship would be in the end. In the end, God made the goal that these two halves recombine, right? With full consciousness. In other words, full consciousness of all of their experiences. 
and I've been through that process myself with my soulmate. And, it, and it's a not totally unimaginable state of power as well as of love for, for your partner, for the other half of you. Right. And this state is achievable on earth. You don't have to die to get there. Right. Are you aware of anyone who has actually achieved it on earth? No one historically has. Right. And the whole reason why the 14 have returned, one of the reasons, is to illustrate what this state looks like in the physical. Because at the moment, it's only been illustrated in the spirit life. It's never been illustrated so in the physical. So you guys plan to achieve it um, while still on the physical plane? Yeah. 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 Could I just ask a question? Sure. Um, if you're in a relationship, and say somebody's been married more than once, mm -hmm. when you pass over, how do you know if, if you'll join up with that person, or will they join up with their, say, first wife or first husband? You know that same question was asked in the first century? Did you know that? <laughs> but the Pharisees who asked me weren't quite as kind as you in their questioning. They asked me, they said that what if a woman had had one husband and he died and then she had another husband and he died and she had another husband and he died and she had seven husbands and they all died. Who would she marry in the spirit world? Was the question they asked. And the answer is, what do you reckon? No, like how do you know? The guy provided poison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in a relationship, you're saying now, yeah, I mean, yeah. you just couldn't imagine not being that person, maybe in another life. How do you know if you're going to be with them, or they might be with the ex-wife? Or yeah, the, the soulmate relationship is a unique relationship, and if you don't experience it here on earth, you will begin to experience it after you've passed. Once you've dealt with some of the emotional injuries that prevent the experience. <coughs> When you do that, you will realise instantly the person you have the greatest attraction to. Right? And you'll know at some point. Now, a lot of spirits don't know that until they're in the fourth sphere or the fifth sphere of the spirit world. Because it often takes that amount of time before they've released those emotional injuries about the gender, about the opposite gender. But if you have released all of those emotional injuries about the opposite gender, you will know on earth who you're going to be with. So the question is actually born from a fear in you about not knowing. But what I'm saying is if you deal with all the emotional injuries about gender, you will know on earth who was your soulmate or who is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that how you answer the Pharisees too? Or? Um, well, they weren't willing to hear, hear the hear answer. Yeah. So, most of the time when a person wasn't willing to hear the answer, I wouldn't give them one. No, right. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't get one, actually. So, um, what about if it's a, not a common thing at the moment for soulmates to be joined and we're in relationships, <clears throat> then how should we deal with those relationships that we're in I mean, like, we're probably not aware, like, I'm not aware if I'm with my soulmate now, but I quite possibly could be. Well, that's no way for me to start opening my soulmate. All of you have attracted your current relationship because of whatever is going on inside of your soul attraction. Your soul attraction is currently a mixture of errors and truth, right? Right at the moment. This attraction has been caused so that you can work through your emotional injuries, okay? as well as learn to experience emotional truths. So, do it in your relationship. Start being totally honest with each other. So, every one of you is afraid to tell the truth. Start telling the truth with every single thing and see what happens. Start being totally open and honest about your own feelings with every single thing and see what happens. Start, you know, if you cheated on them three, three months ago, six months ago, five years ago, tell them, see what happens. Do you see that it's going to bring up some things? Yeah. Let yourself do that and let yourself see what happens. This relationship is there to heal all of these injuries that you have. But it's your attraction. So stay in it, see what happens. But be in truth, be humble, be open to divine truth in that process. How many felt confronted with that statement? Yeah. Yeah.
So, are you saying by that that if the person that you're in a relationship is not your soulmate, it's still a good thing because it's an opportunity to, totally. to deal with things anyway? Your law of attraction has attracted this person into your life for reasons. So you need to allow yourself to work through these reasons truthfully and humbly in your life, yeah. So do that. Don't avoid that. When you avoid that, that stops your growth. So don't, don't, don't go into any relationship thinking, and this, don't, don't go into every relationship thinking, this one's my soulmate, I'm going to have to stay with it forever. <laughs> right. Go into the relationship thinking instead. I'm attracting this person, there's an attraction going on between the two of us, to work through some things. So this is how I still feel, even though I know I've met my soulmate. Like, I don't feel like I have to be with her. I feel like I want to work through all of these emotional injuries that are coming up within me and for her together in that, in that transaction. I've attracted my soulmate now, and I know she's my soulmate, but I've still got the same viewpoint as what you need to have in your own relationship. I attracted this, things are coming up, I need to deal with them honestly, openly, truthfully, and in love. Do that, and you'll soon work out who you're with. <laughs> so it's possible to be with your soulmate and still be able to work through it all? It, it's totally possible to be with your soulmate and be able to work through it all. Your soulmate, your soulmate is going to be one of your biggest triggers. But if you're not with your soulmate, you've attracted this other person to work through something that if you attracted your soulmate, you probably wouldn't work through. Mm. All right? So, trust what's going on right now with your law of attraction. And work your way through the issues that are coming up in the relationship. But be honest and truthful. Issues don't come up when you're dishonest. <laughs> they don't. You notice that? Like when you don't tell them you bought the dress, of course nothing comes up, right? I do. That. Yeah. <laughs> that was years ago. I've yeah. worked through a lot of those issues. Yeah. 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 Now you just say stuff in you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's another issue, right? But anyway. <laughs> but the, the key thing is to work through these issues. Because if you work through these issues and heal them, what will happen in the end is that you'll be able to recognise the person who is your soulmate. And that person may in fact be the person you're with. Yes. And you know, you know, and this this is a confronting statement for you, but you know, your soulmate might be a murderer. Well, there are murderers in the world, aren't there? Yeah, so they've got another half somewhere, haven't they? <laughs> and they've got another half somewhere, haven't they? Unless they move. Yeah. And historically, there have been many people who have had a soulmate who's a murderer. <coughs> and, for example, um, you've all heard of Nero. Remember mm. Nero? Yeah. Mm. Yep, well, there's, in the pageant messages, but, and this is on the CDs that I've given you, and uh, I'll talk about them in a second. In the pageant messages, there's a message from Nero. And he describes his life when he was on earth. He actually murdered his own soulmate. Right? And he found out about that after he passed into the spirit world and lived in the spirit world for over 500 years. After that, he found out that he'd actually murdered his soulmate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you think he'd had a fair few issues to work through oh. about that? <laughs> yeah, he did. Well, that she was troubled. No, no, she wasn't. She wasn't actually. She passed in a very good spiritual condition on earth. She was in the third sphere before she passed. Was she? Ah. And uh, she, was, she was killed in a, in a, like the lions killed her in, in an arena that he'd organised. And uh, yeah, she passed in a very good condition. And she knew he was her, her soulmate very shortly after she'd passed. So you imagine she waited for nearly a thousand years for her soulmate of our time. Working through, if she got, if she worked through all of her emotional issues and got to the celestial spheres, and then all, when he was ready, she went to him and started sorting him out, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> and he progressed and went, he had lots of emotions to work through and eventually he's now, they're both now in the celestial spheres. So, that's a movie I want to make at some point mm. in the future about them, those two. Yeah. So, so how many times have you been incarnated? Just the two. Just the yeah. I mean, in, so no other, just 
just one or two steps. Yeah. There's not very many people who have been incarnated twice, by the way. It's a confronting statement for some of you, based on your beliefs. Well, here's a, <clears throat> yeah, I think I can I just um, ask a question. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can help me if I can. Um, so I was brought up a Catholic, yeah. and um, I, was, I have an issue with um, the way Jesus is portrayed that through. Like I believe in. God, I'm yep. just telling you how it is up till now. Yep. And um, but when Jesus is brought up, I just go, well, you know, because there's a lot of um, well, anger out there in regards to, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, then that's it. And mm. and I have a, an issue with that because I believe that there's a lot of really good people out there who deserve to go and <laughs> go to the pearly gates anyway. Yep. So I guess, um, like, I, I, I always have this. <clears throat> intention that I want to believe in Jesus, but because of the way it's been portrayed, portrayed to me, I yep. just say, get stuffed. Well, exactly. I, I believe in God, yep. and you know, fair enough, Jesus was a good guy, yep. but thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's some great attributes, you know. Yeah, thanks but again. He's not because he's not the only way. Like, yep. I get a bit probably there's a bit of anger there from, and defensiveness from other people trying to say, oh well, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're not going to heaven. Right? Well, let me comment firstly about a few of your comments. Yeah. Firstly, um, the only way of progression that really works is God's way. And all I've ever done is just said what God's way is. So it's not my way, it's God's way. Secondly, um, in the first century I said quite clearly, and it's actually recorded in the Bible, that many people will say to me, did I not do things in your name? And, you know, do all these powerful things in your name and I'll say to them, get away from me because you're actually not any part of me. Right? And the problem is, is nowadays is that a lot of people who are passing into the spirit world who have religious, Christian religious beliefs are passing into the hells. Mm. They're not passing into any other place because they believe in me. Right? They believe in Jesus, but they're still passing into the hells. So what's the issue, do you think? They've got issues. They've got emotional issues, deep emotional core injuries that they are not facing. One is, if I believe that I can kill you because you don't believe what I believe, that's a major emotional injury, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm willing to kill you for my belief? Like. Does that sound harmonious with love to you? No. Uh, it, it sounds more like murder, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and it is. Right? So, so the majority of people on earth who think they believe in Jesus really do not believe in anything that I've taught whatsoever. And my comment to people in the first century was, if you believe me, then do what I do. Right? And what do I do? Treat every person the same? Yeah. I feel I'm the same as you, so you start doing that. I'm not better than you, so don't you feel you're better than someone else. I don't feel lesser than you either, so don't you feel like you're lesser than someone else. We're just brothers and sisters. So bear in mind that a lot of the things that are said about me, and a lot of the things that are practiced about me are certainly not what I taught. And it's very clear that it's not even what I taught from the Bible, which has been grossly modified throughout history, but it's still very obvious. Uh, and I'm certainly not a God, and or, or God, and I'm certainly not a part of God, except that the same way that you can be a part of God, which is to become at one with God through this process that I'm showing you that many other people have already been through. In the spirit world, there's been millions and millions, in fact, billions of spirits who have been through this process. So allow yourself to just start that process. When you do that, you and I will come to be seen as friends of each other, hopefully. And uh, that's what I feel, that those persons are, who are my friends are the people who do God's will. And God's will is those three things that we've been talking about. So let yourself do that. That's, you don't need to believe anything else. You don't even need to believe I'm Jesus. Right? Just do that. And you will come to know the truth about who I am. Even. Right? And this is what I said in the first century. I claim to be the Messiah, 
that was foretold in the Bible, in the scriptures that I had been present, you know, brought up with. And I claimed to be that Messiah, I did. But what I meant by that was I was the messenger of truth that had experienced all of these things and all I was doing was saying that everyone else could experience them too. That's all. Is that what you mean when you say now that you're, um, you believe you're Jesus? It's meaning you're spreading the same word as No, no, I mean I am Jesus. Can I ask another question? Because time's ticking away. I don't want to get into this question. You can. Um, I was just worrying about meditation. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, number one, do you think it's a good thing? But also, if it is, what's the best? Can you give me a bit of a technique? Because <laughs> <laughs> you've got the, you know, you've got the mobile to beat the <laughs> And so have you. And so have you. And meditation. Most people use meditation to get away from their emotions. So what they do is they use meditation to calm themselves. So they're feeling agitated or feeling distressed with their day to day life. And so what they do is they assign a part of their day to day life, maybe an hour or half an hour, where they can sit and just you know, sit in a nice, calm place where they can de deaden the noise of their mind, as they call it, and actually feel clear of emotion. That's not what I'm recommending to do. Use meditation, if you're going to use meditation, use meditation to connect with your emotion. So have the goal quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. So instead of using meditation to run away from that stress that you had today, into it. Run into your stress. You follow me? Yeah. So go into that. Because there's a reason why stress was created in your life today. And you need to feel that. And you need to heal that inside of yourself, right? Now you can use meditation to access that. Whatever techniques you might want to use to access that are going to be beautiful from God's perspective. But the instant you make the choice inside of yourself to actually get away from your emotion you are actually making a choice to get away from yourself and you're wake, making a choice to get away from God. So all these people who believe meditation is leading them to God, <coughs> it's just not happening. What it's doing is it's leading them to a place of the sixth sphere, which is the place of feeling that they are at one with the universe and feeling that they are at one with each other and feeling all of these different feelings of blankness and sometimes it's a feeling of no desire mm. getting rid of desire, getting rid of passion so that they can mm. do that and while all that state may seem appealing at the moment with your emotions because some of the emotions feel bad, right? in the end what you want to do is be a completely emotional being full of desire and passion full of longing and have no negative emotions that you experience wouldn't that be a better place then? Mm. To actually be full of passion, full of desire, full of longing, but every single passion, desire and longing be in harmony with divine love. Mm. <coughs> yeah. I've often found when people come to my meditation classes is that when they start to meditate and be still, be still and know that I'm God, um, all of those things start to come up. Because they've, they've stilled themselves, mm -hmm. the emotional stuff said, well, have a look at me, here I am. And uh, I think that meditation would be a really great way to get in touch with those emotions. Mm -hmm. It can be. And it it just depends on my intention. Mm -hmm. If my intention is to run away from my emotions, it mm -hmm. could be a great way to do that too. Mm -hmm. So the problem is with a lot of uh, meditation techniques is they teach you to run away from your emotions. They teach you to be without desire, without longing, without or any of those things. The truth is that on a day-to-day -day basis, God is teaching you. You don't need to meditate for God to teach you. God is already teaching you through the law of attraction. God is already showing you what you need to work on emotionally. You think about it. What happened to you today? Anyone want to talk about something that happened to them today? Something that distressed you today? Everyone's afraid of being on the spot. Because yeah. huh? there's so much that happened today. Every single moment of your life today 
actually happen through the law of attraction. I watched the DVD. Yeah, so something happened through the law of attraction. What was that? You had a longing to get some more truth? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And how did you find the DVD? Did that answer a lot of your questions about truth? Yes, and it gave me permission to have a sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and it gave me permission to wake up yeah. and learn a bit more. Yeah, awesome. And then I ran out of time and couldn't watch the fourth, yeah. which I watched when I got home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't find that stressful. Yeah. Or dis in disharmony. Yeah. I feel privileged. So all of that really so there's a positive law of attraction yeah. going on there. Yeah. Who who had a positive law of attraction oh. happen to them today? Yeah. You mm -hmm. want to mention one of them? You'd like to mention one. What was a positive thing that happened to you today that you really enjoyed? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I had lots of lovely people come to our home who I wasn't expecting. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's beautiful. Something happened in your law of attraction today. Every day. To happen, yeah. yeah. What happened? What happened negatively today? Any of you had some things negative? It's okay. Frustrated man who refused to talk about them. Okay, okay. So what was happening there? Um, we're not remember it. Frustration, anger covers. Yeah. Fear, which covers deeper emotion. So beautiful law of attraction to expose some underlying emotion. And our children are perfect at it. Hey, yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. You know why? Because we created them in the sense that we created their emotional injuries, so they reflect them immediately back on us. Now, when we get frustrated and angry with them, it's a bit unfair. But that is something because we do because of an underlying emotion of not wanting to see something going on. Yeah. And I've spent spent like the last couple of days with with Janine and uh, Zink. 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 Sorry, Zink. And. Emotional <laughs> 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 wound. Thank you, that's a good trick. <laughs> you needed it. You needed that, yeah. Just attracted it? Yeah, just attracted it. <laughs> and we were, did, we were talking of, on a day to day basis, on a minute, you know, hour by hour basis, what was happening with children and what attraction was happening. Like, with all these behaviours the children are doing and the feelings. And, starting to really see like what's happening on a minute by minute basis in our lives that we're creating mm. yeah. powerful creations mm -hmm. yeah to expose our emotions yeah. all right now the soulmate question though did it does that answer satisfactorily for everyone um, can i just ask if we start working through well i've been married 40 years or whatever yep. if i start changing working through things yep. does my partner my husband then start that as well or do I grow away from him and like what happens? Um, what do you reckon might happen? <laughs> I don't know but I'd be unhappy if we weren't together. Okay. So well at the moment I would be. So what's preventing you from don't making the choice? I didn't really know. It's a fear isn't it? Yeah. It's a fear that if you do this that somehow you'll be led apart from each other and so that's what's driving the question. It's a good question though. Yeah, but I understand that what's driving the question is this emotional fear that if I actually go ahead and do this emotional work that AJ is suggesting to me, what's going to happen at the end is I'll be drawn apart from my partner and I'll be in a... What will I feel then? I'll feel... Allow yourself to feel what that will be. Yeah. The, the truth is, though, that uh, your soulmate will be attracted to you as you deal with all of your emotional injuries and your current partner will also be attracted to you. <laughs> Ironically, because you, you're a better person, aren't you? But, but that doesn't mean they'll deal with their stuff. Because their stuff is about their free will, isn't it? Yeah. They have free will just like you do. They have the choice to make just like you have. And they might make the choice not to deal with their stuff for all sorts of reasons. You know, the mates at work might laugh at them, so they're not going to deal with it. You know, it might be just simple things like that that cause them not to deal with their stuff. The key is, how much do you want your relationship with God and how much do you want bliss? Now at some point in your life, now or in the future, you know, you will need to make that choice of how much you want it. You want, to, you want it more than anything else. You will get to that point. Whether you make that choice now or 100 years time after you've passed, either way you'll make it sooner or later. Right? Now, my feelings are 
what's the point in being like I'm, let's say I've been in a relationship 40 years and that relationship I still have not learned my lessons I'm still not working through my emotions about all these responses that I have what's the point of this relationship that I've attracted if not for that I need to at least do that right? when I do that what will happen is I will soon know whether that relationship is the soulmate relationship I think it is or whether it's not. Then if he is my soulmate, then he'll start working through things, didn't you say? He will feel drawn in yeah. doing it, yeah. What, what Mary said she's felt is that she sort of felt in a lot of ways like she was being drawn into it without her being willing. Mm -hmm. oh. And so she went through quite a lot of feelings of anger about that, like feeling almost like she didn't have a free will of her own. Mm. Uh, but she, for some reason, felt drawn. And once she came to the terms of the fact that she just needed to feel her own emotions completely and consistently, then she felt much more relaxed with that prospect. So, yeah, he will feel drawn into dealing with his own emotions, probably whether he's your soulmate or not, but you will recognise it in time, whether he is or not. But why have a relationship with somebody, even if it's been 40 years, that in the end you're not dealing with something with... Like, yeah. all you're doing is creating a fictitious relationship mm -hmm. then, aren't you? Really? Now, no, that's confronting, because a lot of times we've, we've absorbed 40 years of our life and we've mm -hmm. invested, is the way we see it, 40 years of our life. But honestly, 40 years in your life is nothing. Mm -hmm. like, but the majority of people that you would, the majority of partners that, that um, I would speak to um, have issues. Yep. And they still stay together. Yep. They're happy together. No, they're not. They are happy together. No, they're not. They work through their stuff together. And they have a really good relationship. And so they come to the end of their lives, or one of the, those people come to the end of their lives. And so that's, that's finished then. And I'm thinking, why, why um, disrupt that relationship um, to work through issues that you're sort of slowly working through anyway? Just a quick survey. How many of you are 100% happy with your relationships? I didn't say that they were 100% happy. <laughs> <laughs> the question I asked was how many of you are 100% happy in your relationships? 96.5. 96.5. <laughs> Let, let's be honest. So being unhappy sometimes, is that still happy? <laughs> well, this is the thing. How do you gauge happiness? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, for a start. So, so let's talk about happiness. Now, your question is driven by a fear. Yes. What's the fear? Say that again. Your question is driven by a fear within you. What's the fear? I don't have the fear. No, I'm sorry, but you are lying to yourself. I'm not lying to myself. I do not have the fear. What's the fear? I don't have the fear. So why ask the question? Why would you be concerned I'm about just, what's happening with these people? In the question. Yeah, but why are you concerned about what's happening with these people? Your, your question was no, not surrounding what? Not a concern, just, a, just an interest. You're not concerned, you reckon? What, no. what do you all feel? Is she concerned? No. What do you feel? Mm -hmm. See, no, just hang a sec. All of, you, all of us need to be honest about what we're feeling from each other as well. Mm -hmm. What are you feeling? Do you feel there's a concern? Absolutely. What's, mm -hmm. What do you feel the concern is? Curiosity. No, there's more than curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. It's yeah. a very good question. Yeah. But there, but there is an emotion driving it. I'm trying to get at this. There's an emotion driving it. Well, the question in the end was she was saying, why disrupt something that people are on the surface happy to tolerate or give No, I didn't say that. I said that people, people are working through issues through that relationship that they have. So why disrupting? So, so why, yes, okay. yes, so slowly, slowly. And it may not be a fabulous relationship. But people slowly, slowly are willing to do the <coughs> What's the emotion? <coughs> going along really well. 
Can you see, can you see though how much all of us have started to tolerate relationships that are not perfect, but rather just satisfactory to a degree? So why do we do that? Because we have a feeling inside of us. And what's the feeling? That we will never get what's perfect. That's the feeling we have. Right? All of us have this feeling that's a childhood feeling most of the time. It isn't the word perfect an individual thing anyway? Of course it's an individual thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not so arguing. my perfect would be different to Aaron's perfect. Yeah. But see now what are we doing? Actually. Now we're intellectualising yeah, our, right. at the fact that we haven't got an imperfect relationship. I think we're judging. I think it's from um, not recognising your truth from within and speaking the truth. Well, it's all this surrounding information that's coming together. Very much so. It all gets back down to those three things that I've mentioned, right, in the end. But if we look at honest, look honestly at things. I'm not saying just because you have an imperfect relationship in your own eyes that you should leave your partner. What I'm saying is, what do you want number one in your life? For many of us, you know what we want? Security, safety, all of these other things. Why do we want those things? Because we're afraid and that's why we want them, right? What I'm saying to you, seek first God's love Seek first God's truth, and all of these other things will be added to you, right? So what that means is that you'll be in a place of bliss with God in a few years, maybe two, three, four years, depends on how much you are dedicated to dealing with your emotions. When you're in that state, you now have, a cre you have the ability to create a totally blissful relationship with the partner. Now, wouldn't you want that if you had that available to you? Wouldn't you want that? So why would you choose to delay that? There's got to be an emotion that chooses the delay of that. You follow me? There has to be an emotion, right? Mm -hmm. That chooses to delay that realisation of that kind of a relationship. So the a lot of the emotions are, you know, we tolerate things being just normal rather than things being blissful. We tolerate it, don't we? Let's look at our lives. How many times in a day do you tolerate something that in reality you think you didn't want? So are you really fear of change? Huge fears of change. We have huge fears of change within us. right? And most of us have huge fear of change because of what the change means. Not only to ourselves, but our partner, our children, all sorts of things will be affected by these changes. right? Um, and we are so afraid of all of that that, that we then think, in our mind, we then think, do I really want to do this? Right? And my suggestion is to think a bit, a bit differently. My suggestion is to go down the track of thinking it this way. You have the potential of being in bliss with God within you know, a few years of your life. Right? When you are in that state, you then have the potential to actually create a totally blissful relationship with another person. No matter who you have now, it might be the person you have now, even, but you are potentially able to do that. Why not do that as rapidly as is your desire, that your desire feels drawn to do? Why put that off until you die or till they die? Why would you want to do that? But you may not necessarily need to chuck out the one you got. You may very well step up and be honest and truthful. Well, remember what I said. The one you got, you've yeah. got right now, yeah. has been attracted to you. Mm. And I've been attracted to you because of your own emotional condition that you need to work through. Work through it. Mm. But be yeah. truthful, honest, mm -hmm. open, and all those things in working through it. Mm. You'll soon find out whether you'll stay together or not if mm. you do that. Won't you? Oh, sure so do that. That is the only way you'll be ever at one with God. So I'm saying to you, put your relationship with God first, then your relationship with yourself next. And who's yourself? So let's look at God's priorities for you. Number one is put God first. Number two is put yourself. Now when I say yourself, 
I mean your complete soul. Next. So that's you and your soul mate come next. Do you follow me? Is this the same, like you were just talking before about um, with the soulmate um, diagram that uh, the soul operates within God's principles or it, uh, is this what, are they the same things? Yeah. So it's God's principles like, is it? All of God's laws actually yeah. revolve around these basic priorities. Yeah. And when I put my priorities out of harmony with God's priorities, I will automatically create pain in my own life. Mm. Automatically. So is that the same as the top ten that they put in the Bible? Or? The top ten? No, no, they are not the ten commandments. What about the Bible? Should we read the Bible? No, why? Okay, that's you don't have to read the Bible. Yes, <laughs> The Bible didn't exist when I was there. Like, I was a, did I read the Bible? No, like the whole, I read the Old Testament, but the whole of the New Testament didn't even exist. It was written by man. Well, the whole lot was written by man. Like, and honestly, um, like, if, why would it be all of a sudden important for you to read the whole New Testament before you can become a one with God when it never was even available when I became a one with God? <laughs> <laughs> uh, does that make sense though? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Isn't it funny, isn't it, how a lot of things really make sense when you break it down to the brass roots and then you wonder, well, what in the hell is everyone saying about the Bible and you've got to read it every day? Do you know what I mean? Now, there are a lot of things that are really good in the Bible. I love a lot of the things in the Bible myself, right? And, but that, you, you, you don't have to become at one with God by reading the Bible. You become at one with God by doing the three things that we just talked about earlier. Is that the same as reading other spiritual texts? Exactly the same, yeah. Anything that connects you with God, read. Like, honestly, if an R-rated movie connects you with God, you go and see it. You understand? Like, yeah. what, how will it connect with God? It might trigger some emotion, right? Of, you know, it might be an R-rated movie with violence in it that triggers some fear in you. <coughs> of you, and you, really, you have a big cry and release a heap of fear, and you feel closer to God, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying don't do anything. Really, do what you your soul needs. To grow. Yeah. Don't judge it, do it, what the soul needs to grow. Remember, every time you act in disharmony with love, you will feel it in your heart. You will, if you open your heart emotionally, you will feel the penalty hit you. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm not saying that you're going to get away with doing everything you choose to do. <laughs> I am saying do whatever leads you closer to God. Does that make sense? So, God, if you put God first, and then you put your, your soul, your complete soul, next, and then you put your relationship with others, including your children, next. How many of you are putting your children first at the moment? Right. A lot of people do that, right? Because there's a belief that we've got to do that. I had, I had my whole priority list totally screwed up, right? Totally screwed up. You know why? Because... The yourself part was down on 999 <laughs> myself, right? Yeah. It was down there. Jeez, a lot of people. Yeah, and how many times do we do that? Mm. Right? Put ourselves right at the end of the list. So, if you get your priorities right the way God created your priorities to be, what will happen is you will connect to God very rapidly and you'll trigger lots of your own emotions in the process. You know, if you've been putting yourself at 999, and now you put yourself as second to the relationship with God. You know what's going to happen to everyone around you who are used to you being at 1999? You know, they're going to be quite challenged, aren't they? They're going to be quite upset with you. They're going to trigger some emotions in you. Right? And if you own them, you'll work through a lot of things just by changing your priorities. So let yourself change your priorities. But understand that every single question, and this is something I've been trying to say the entire night really, every single question you ask is driven by an emotion. You don't believe it is in many cases, but it is. It's driven by an emotion, many times by a fear, right, within you. And all you need to do is be honest and allow the connection to it. Right? If you are dishonest with it, you will not get the connection to it and you are only harming your own relationship with God and your own relationship with yourself. 
You don't harm anybody else by doing it, only yourself. Yeah. What, what question were we up to? <laughs> Well, we've moved on. I've got a question if you've run out. Fire away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just got a bit of a fear that if I don't ask it, <laughs> my friend will be upset with me. All oh, right, yeah, no worries. <laughs> so this is from my friend who is too ill to come tonight. Yeah. Her apologies. So it doesn't make it does make sense to me, but not as much as it does to her. God, having made up to level twenty two. So, after making those levels, why is it that there are all the lower levels and the suffering? So the People question for animals, plants, for the earth. Yep. Why did we come into physical incarnation at all on these lower spiritual levels? How come our imperfections and all the suffering really? Yeah. So, what's the underlying emotion driving the question? Do you feel? But let's look at that first. What do you feel it might be? Some sort of grief. The grief about suffering, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. The pain of the suffering Sympathy. that we're going through yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. And the question is a very good question. Why am I going through this pain all the time? Why is mankind, why is humanity going yeah. through this pain? What's the ultimate cause of my pain? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a really good question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so God, firstly I'd just like to clarify a few things. Remember I've said sphere-wise, at the moment, there are 1 through to 22, right? Mm. At the moment, there are 22 different dimensions, infinite dimensions in the spirit world, 22 of them. Now, God didn't create them. <laughs> For a start. You know what happened? <coughs> God created something else. God created the potentiality of them. Everything God created was potential. He didn't create the actual thing. You know what he did? He decided to involve you in the process. So he created the potential of the, its existence and he allowed you to create it. Oh, that's right. So what actually happened was, at the first time there was no spheres, there was only what we would call nowadays the sixth sphere existed, but there were no other dimensions. But God created a heap of laws and principles that allowed for the creation of those dimensions. And then what he did was he allowed you one thing that is a beautiful gift that he gave you, and one gift that you will actually feel is beautiful at some time in the future, because many of you at the moment feel it's not, and that's the gift of free will. Now, a lot of times we then go down track of, oh, this gift of free will is a curse, right? If it wasn't for free will, you know, there'd be no one murdering somebody else, would there? And if it wasn't for free will, there'd be no one uh, doing any raping or any of those kinds of things, right? Would there? God would have stopped each person doing whatever. But actually, every one of these choices that we have made, we have made because of one decision that we made. And the decision was this. It was the decision of... Self-reliance. As soon as... And this, by the way, this is the biggest emotion within each of us that we need to eradicate. It's the biggest emotion within each of us that needs to be released. It's the biggest emotion that controls all of your negative experiences. Is your desire to be self-reliant rather than God-reliant. Hmm. Right? Now, the ultimate in self-reliance is the sixth fear. That's as far as you'll ever be able to progress in self-reliance. Because you're God, that, that's as far as you're concerned on the sixth fear. As far as I'm concerned, I'm God when I'm in the sixth fear. Yeah. I am at the pinnacle of self-reliance. Yeah. I'm now God. Right? <laughs> now, how many New Age things have you read <coughs> where they're teaching you that you're God? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Just lots and lots of them. That's all the pinnacle of self-reliance. Right? 
Well, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting you're God's child. Right? And I'm God's child. And we become God-reliant. Right? Now, because of self-reliance, every other human emotion that is negative was created. As soon as I create self-reliance, I start putting myself above other things, including above God. God. And all of God's laws, I start putting myself above all of them automatically. Now, am I ever above them really? No. no. So straight away, every time I put myself above them, there's a penalty. And you know what the penalty is? Pain every time to myself and to <coughs> everyone around me. So all human pain and suffering has been created from that one emotion. And you know that's going to be the hardest emotion for you to release. That emotion. Without My mind can't even comprehend what that is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I'm searching and, and certainly I'm dyslexic, but I can't, you know, I'm, I'm truthful here, yeah. I can't even comprehend, comprehend. What, what that word What is. that means. No. Yeah. So is that what they call the separation? Yeah, all separation is caused by that emotion. Now understand that in your progression you will become more and more of an individual if you're on the divine path. Right? So we're not talking about individualization here. We're not talking about you remaining an individual because you will remain an individual. You will not become at one with the universe as you progress. You will actually become more and more of an individual as you progress. But you will not feel separation. You will also not feel self-reliant. You will become completely God-reliant. You, you will trust God implicitly. Let's look at that particular aspect of reliance. How many of you feel you trust God implicitly in everything you do? Right? It's, it's really hard to do that when you think about it. Well, we want to. Sorry? We want to. We want to. It's the desire. The desire is there too. Which is fantastic. Yeah. But there will be lots of emotional injuries I need to work through before I will get to that point. Wouldn't this be an instinctive thing? I'm thinking about sort of cavemen um, needing to run like hell, you know, not just sort of stand there and say, God save me, you know, there's this brontosaurus or whatever it's called. <laughs> Chasing him down. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't that be a sort of an instinctive thing which is then passed on? I know we're, we're beyond that sort of physical danger in a lot of cases. Um, passed well, on. Why would I have an emotion thing? of physical danger? because I don't believe the truth. That in fact there is no danger if my soul is not attracting. Yeah, but if you're a caveman, you're not sort of really going to intellectualise this. You think, look, Jesus, you know, sure, pardon me. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I'm like, yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> okay, yeah. So how, how, how would you know what the emotion of self-reliance is then? How would you know? What Let's just go is? back to this question for a moment, though. Yeah. The question is really like, like, how do I stop myself from responding in instinctively to a situation? Mm, yeah. What I'm saying to you is that when the emotions have disappeared in you that cause you to respond <coughs> instinctively in fear, you will no longer respond in fear. Mm. Right? You will instinctively respond in love. Mm. And where love is, there is no fear. Now, now at the moment, a lot of times, we're not instinctively responding with love, are we? We're having to try to respond in love. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm talking about is actually instinctively responding because we've released all the emotions within us that are fearful. There's no longer any emotions driving us to respond in fear. No attractions. There's no attractions either of fear. We are instinctively responding in love. It's automatic. So you know how all Christian religions today give you a rule book list, right? Don't they? You must not. Do you know them? <laughs> How many of you remember any? Who was brought up Christian? A few of you? Yeah. Okay. How many of you remember them? Not very well. <laughs> you must not. Steal is one. We know that, right? You must not. Commit adultery. That's right. Covet thy neighbor's wife. Okay. Yeah. And thy neighbor's goods. Okay. Um, honour thy father and mother. Honour thy father and mother. Very good. That's one of them too. 
All right, now, these are a list of rules, right, that were written down and taught to you. Now, did it make it easier for you to do them? No. No, it didn't, did it? No. What actually happened was you became conscious of the fact you couldn't do them permanently and you felt more guilty. Didn't, isn't that what happened? But, but it was fearful in the Catholic Church because it had happened yes. and you went for absolution. Exactly. So, you know? so then they come up with the thing of how so to deal with my guilt. Yeah, so I can do it all week, but as long as I go along to So, So in other words, here's my rule list of what I can't do, then here's how to, how to handle what I can't do, <laughs> which is all to do with dealing with my guilt and shame about it all, right? And so what do we grow up with? A whole generation of religious people who are very ashamed of themselves constantly, feeling really bad about themselves constantly, and feeling that's and that's feeling that, that Jesus' blood like covers all that somehow. No idea really how, but it does, right? There's something more than that too when we had the list that we couldn't do or we should do. And then we had to this is what you do to fix that. Yep. But if you don't do what you need to do to fix it, then God doesn't love you anymore. And God will punish you. And you're going to and purgatory. And eternally punish you. Exactly. Like yeah. And you're going to purgatory and then you buy a leg out and an arm out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I didn't get them. So all of these things, all of these teachings, what are they doing? They just create a fear. Yeah. 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 Fear based. Now, now, what I talked about in the first century and what I'm talking about now is the same thing. And that is that the new birth or the transformation of the soul is all about one thing, and that is getting rid of the emotions in you that cause you to do those things. Right. So, let's say I have a feeling I'd like to steal. If I deal with the emotion in me that causes me to feel like I need to steal, then I won't steal anymore, will I? And it will be automatic. Let's say, let's look at even basic issues like smoking, right? Smoking cigarettes, you know they're harmful, right? You know they're going to kill you in some way, right? That's, you know, there's plenty of evidence about that. Why would I keep doing it then? Because I have an addiction. An emotion inside of myself. It's not a physical addiction. It's an addiction to an emotion getting satisfied inside of myself when I pick up that cigarette. Now, if I... Don't, so, don't make a rule, give up cigarettes or else. Don't do that. Instead, do what? Yeah. Release the emotion that causes you to want the cigarette. And you know, as soon as you do that, the cigarette will just disappear. You will no longer want one. Like, let's say I'm a bit chubby, right? And I'm not too happy about that. What's caused that? An emotion inside of myself that I am not allowing myself to recognise. You follow me? So instead of saying, oh, I've got to put myself on a diet, that's not going to do it. That's not going to make me lose weight. And this is why people yo-yo diet. You know the yo-yo dieting? Mm -hmm. Because in the end, what's happening? What's happening is I go on a diet here in my mind. I eat properly. I can only maintain it for a while because I'm fighting my emotion constantly. Mm -hmm. Right? And so what happens after six months or 12 months? I give up. Right? <laughs> Two weeks. Four hours yeah. every Monday. Yeah. I give up. Right? And then when I give up, what happens? I slip back into exactly the same behaviour that created my weight and I put my weight back on. And then I feel bad about myself, bad enough to actually deal with it here again. And so what I do? And, so, and it goes like that and like that for a long time of my life before I realise one thing and that is that every bit of weight that I put on is all about my emotion. If I deal with my emotion, what will happen is the weight will fall off me without me changing my diet even. It will just fall off me. And I will be a different person inside of myself and I won't create the emotions that are creating me wanting to put on weight. And a lot of those emotions are sexually related, by the way. So what happens if you know that it's an emotion that you need to address, but you can't work out what the emotion is? And if that's the case, you're not being truthful with yourself. Because your law of attraction is already telling you what the emotion <coughs> is, and all I'm doing is staying blind to it. So for example, I'll give you an example out of my own life. Like, 
for seven years I stayed in a relationship where the girl never wanted to acknowledge me to any of her family or friends. That's a long time to stay in that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. What was my emotion? Neediness. I was a bit, so obviously neediness for something. Deep unworthiness, yeah. obviously, right? Yeah. How could I even stay in a relationship with that, yeah. that, that and feel good about it? Yeah. Fear of rejection, mm -hmm. very good. Perhaps you're trying to keep a low profile. Oh, no, 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 no. Last time. <laughs> <laughs> Fear of being hurt. That's right. Yeah. Okay. You add all those emotions up, and they are all the emotions I refused to experience. Did she know who you were at the time? Sorry? You had told her who you were? No, no, oh, no. Right. This was before I knew, like, yeah. there were lots of emotions that I've had through my life of memories, yeah. but I refused to accept who I was as well. Okay. So I went through this whole process of denial of that as well. Yeah. So it life. wasn't because of who you were that you didn't? No. 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 It was totally because of my emotional injuries that needed to be exposed. Okay which were all these other ones of rejection. Oh, wow, shame too. Yeah, wow. shame and yeah. <laughs> Fear of being alone. Fear of being alone. Fear of being unwanted. <laughs> yeah. so, so what I needed to do is experience all of those emotions, but I chose to not do that for seven years. But my life was telling me every day. My life was telling me every single day. You need to do with this, you need to do with this. And a lot of the days I was crying, by the way. A lot of the days I did have a cry. Every single time she wanted me to hide on the back seat when we were driving down. The road. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did do that. I did do that. I know you laugh, but I, I, did, I did that. I actually hid on the back seat driving past people she knew. Because she said to. Because she said to. So why did you keep that? <laughs> well, she obviously had the opposite emotions. Yeah, but so she had some issues too. Oh, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. But I'm only looking at mine, they're the only ones I can change. What happens if you think you've got an emotion about a, something in particular? Obviously, there's an emotion under that. Like, I have a, an emotion about my husband's addiction to alcohol. Right. Which goes back to my childhood. Yep, I know course. that, yep. but I can't, I haven't been able to work out what it is. Yep. What do you reckon it might be? Just off the top of your head? I don't know. You do, uh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Yeah, what happened in your childhood until? Um, my father was a heavy drinker. Okay. What happened with you with that? Um, he used to come home, he used to bring a lot of people home in the pub closed mm -hmm. and I, my, bro, my twin brother and I used to be dragged out of bed mm -hmm. to sit on drunk's knees mm -hmm. and they would be kissing us and cuddling us mm -hmm. and nothing more than that but it was, I just couldn't cope with, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't like it mm -hmm. so I didn't like the smell of it. Mm -hmm. And can you can you feel what you know they were like as well? There was a lot of things in there you didn't like when they were drunk. Well, when you're two, you don't understand. No, that's that. all right. It's not about what you understand. It's about how you feel. Right. All I know is that I I hated being dragged out of bed yeah. to sit on a stranger's knee, and I was felt uncomfortable about being touched by strangers. Okay, so there's a lot of touch issues going on there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you felt your way through all of that? Did that happened when you were little? Because you see, if we're still getting upset about something that's happening in our life right now, it'll be related to the fact that we've not dealt with the core emotion when we were little. But I want to deal with it, but I can't work out what it is. Uh, can I just stop everyone from saying this? You only want to deal with something when you're currently dealing with it. <laughs> The truth, and we've got to be very truthful with ourselves. Remember, you create automatically what you really want right now. You follow me? So when you truly want to deal with an emotion at that instant, you will be dealing with it. Before then, you're not wanting to deal with it. So we need to be honest. If I'm not feeling the emotion, I am not wanting to deal with it. So I'm allowed to not want to deal with it. That's fine. So I do. No, you don't. 
<laughs> if you wanted to deal with it, you'd be crying right now. Right now. And that's okay, I'm not judging that. I'm just saying, if you want to deal with an emotion, you will be actually experiencing it right this instant. I used to cry then. I know you used to cry then. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about whether you want to deal with this emotion or not right now. Be truthful about that. So, I'm allowed to not want it for a start. So, for a start, you're allowed to not deal with this emotion. You've got free will, right? So you're allowed to not deal with it. So there's no judgment about that. You're can allowed I, to do that. Can I talk about that stuff? Can I just keep going for a second first? Though? The reason why this is important to understand is because we need to first state the truth about our current condition before we'll access any emotion. Do you understand what I've just said? Mm -hmm. If you are not truthful with yourself about an emotion, you will not feel the emotion. You follow me? Mm -hmm. I think so. Right. So, so the I truth is, I to do okay, that's truthful. You thought you did, that's truthful. So the truth is, I don't, what's happening right now is the truth. So I don't want to deal with this, is the truth. To deal with whatever it is, right? That's the first truth I need to accept inside of myself. If right at the moment I am not feeling the emotion, then right at the moment, the truth is that I don't want to deal with this emotion. That's okay, you're allowed to not deal. Uh, that's, but that's the first truth I need to accept. The next thing I need to say to myself is, I'm allowed to not feel this emotion. What's that telling me? I am making a choice. I'm making a choice and I'm allowed to make this choice. Uh, now I'm in a state where I'm being truthful. So let's look at this thing that's going on for yourself. I think I want to deal with the emotion, but the truth is, I do not want to deal with this emotion. And I'm allowed to not want to feel this emotion. But one question that's worth asking is, why do I want that? So right now, if you can ask yourself the question, <coughs> what comes to your mind about why you don't want to feel these emotions? And wh what we're starting to address here is what I call our fear list. Right? We have some fears about addressing this emotion. If you address this emotion with your husband, what's your fears? I have to do something about it. So you feel that you have to act, mm -hmm. and you don't want to act. Why are you afraid of acting? What might happen there? Because if there's a choice between me and alcohol... What will he choose? Alcohol. You feel he would choose alcohol? Mm -hmm. There's okay. no doubt about it. Okay. And then what does that make you feel inside of you? If that choice had been made by someone else, how do you feel? Worthless. Yeah. Okay. And if, if he's making a choice putting alcohol over you, what are you going to need to do that? What is she going to need to do perhaps? Change the situation. Change it. You're mm. going to need to change this. Mm. And that's what you're afraid of, aren't you? Can you see that? I, I know I'm afraid of change. But you're afraid of changing this. Right? So then the question is, make yourself a fearless. Why am I afraid of changing this? What are you afraid of? See, it's our fears that stop us from feeling our causal emotions. So what might... I don't know what I'm afraid of. Well, you, you at the moment don't want to know what you're afraid of. And you're allowed to not know what you're afraid of. But I do want but to know. why do you not want to know what you're afraid of? But I do want to know. No, but that's, see, that's a, that you're not telling yourself the truth. The truth is, if you don't know why you're afraid, it's because you do not want to know why you're afraid. 
And I'm, I know it's one of the biggest lessons that I have to learn. It is, I agree. I know that. And you know it's related to your childhood and these drunken men. Mm. Yes, and also my father used to come home and, from the pub and sit at, turn the light on and sit at the foot of my bed and dribble crap for hours. Mm. And I'd cry because all I wanted to do was go to sleep, and which is, is that, similar. And is that all your father used to do? Yes, it's definitely all we used to do. As far as I can remember, and if I've chosen not to remember it, that's probably, I, I think that's what I'm frightened of. So what are you frightened of? I'm frightened, frightened of knowing what actually did happen. Exactly. Why would you be so frightened of that, you think? Because maybe something did happen. Exactly. So what do you really feel inside of yourself? That something actually did happen, that you've been telling yourself all these years that didn't happen. Right. And the truth is, something did happen. Because mm. I, I can feel that. Mm. And that's what you're afraid I have been starting to wonder that lately. Yes. Mm. And if you think of your law of attraction and all the different things that have been happening over the past few months, you can see that already you've been led down that path that perhaps something did happen. Can you see that? Mm. Things that have been discussed around you, talked about around you, things that have things that popped out in newspapers to you, uh, things that have popped out on telly to you. And the few little things that have come up with an older sister that she blanked out, mm -hmm. and they've only just come up fairly recent. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's. The truth is that it is one of the biggest things for you to resolve inside of yourself, mm -hmm. and it's certainly related to these, your father and this drunken men and being in your life. Mm. And you need, the, the fear you have is that what you think might have happened did. And if you believe it did, you're going to have to deal with a lot of emotion about that. And that's what you're afraid of. So that's the starting point mm. before you even get to your husband. It's, yeah. So you've got to start from the grassroots. Yeah, the, the trigger that. is the husband drinking. Mm causing all of this association to be, to occur. And the, the more, like you yeah, the more I try to work through, well I think, well I'm obviously not, but mm -hmm. um, the more I try to work through this, mm -hmm. the more he acts and looks like my father. Exactly. <laughs> and he will. And when I first met him, he was he was Nothing sober. like my father. No, he wasn't no, sober. Right he sober. used to drink. But not excessively. He used to, used to drink excessively, but it wasn't. I did, it didn't bother me. Didn't it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> my first husband, I chose. Mm -hmm. I chose because he didn't drink at all. Right. Yeah. And then something happened. I don't even know really what happened, but. Because you needed to deal with the <laughs> And then I met someone <laughs> to face. <laughs> Exactly. Know, I've known that he was my father. Exactly. But I always tell myself I love my father. Exactly. And this is a big issue that most abuse victims, if I can say that, have experienced where they actually love the person, feel they love the person who has harmed them. And it's a very big thing. That's what is a big fear. So can you see how all, all we did was just dug a bit deeper, deeper, deeper with your fears? And as soon as we started doing that, we started seeing what you're really afraid of. And usually the things we're really afraid of are the things that we did experience when we were little. Yeah. So just allow that to settle with you now, emotionally settle with you. That it's no, perhaps no longer an idea, but maybe some abuse has occurred now, because this is what you're afraid of. There's a very high likelihood that that has occurred. So when I go home tonight, and because my husband's been on his own tonight, I'll go home to mm -hmm. really severe alcohol fumes mm -hmm. and everything. And what I've been doing is trying to ignore that, yep. squash it, yep. send him love, yep. which I don't really feel. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm doing a wonderful job because I'm exactly. sending him love, so yeah. that's going to get me to God quicker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
top of my whole world. <laughs> exactly. Sorry about that. Well, I'm not really sorry because no, the truth sorry. is always best. Well, I'm pleased that you have because I'm getting nowhere. Exactly. No. See, when we live in this fictitious state, which is a lie to self, we also, our whole life gets nowhere. It just repeats the same patterns, the same problems, over and over. Only when we start facing the truth does our life really begin to change. So the truth is that there's this big truth, sort of like a mountain on the side of your vision, <laughs> that you've been walking around and actually trying to remain disconnected from. It's your biggest fear. And, and because you keep telling yourself, I want to do, I want to do, I want to do, you're skipping over the fear about dealing, which is discovering the truth about your relationship with your father. Oh, I've got an, an amazing feeling of guilt. Yeah. And I've also got an... Um, I feel um, like I'm, I've been trying to deal with this for a long time myself. But when I try to talk to the people that are close to me, none of them actually believe me and I'm just getting this feeling that that's was so, the same when I was a child. So law of attraction, yeah. Yes. And I mean, I heard a little story tonight that um, touched me deeply, mm. which was your story yeah. about yeah. when you were a child and you didn't tell anyone because no one would believe you. Yeah. So these are all common emotions, uh, abuse, like childhood abuse type emotions. And, and these are all, your law of attraction is working very well. It's exposing these emotions to you. But can I just tell you how she got here, though? She yeah. only got here by me. And, yeah. I, and I got the DVD and had to very quickly get it to Karen. And because she'd committed to come, she, walked, she looked at the DVD last night and she said, if I could have pulled the plug, I would have. But because I made this com com you know, Commitment to come. come. Oh. I felt sick when I watched the DVD. <laughs> yeah. How many others felt sick when you watched it? No one. So there must be something going on there, right? There must be something going on inside of yourself where you're afraid of truth so much that you can feel sick. But yesterday I had a day that was just an amazingly negative day from start to finish. Yeah. So I'm just assuming, well, this is my day for feeling like this. Yeah, but sometimes what happens is when we're confronted with truth, we feel sick with fear about it. Mm. you follow me? Mm. And that's one of the emotions that you will mm. feel. But I had to face a lot of fears yesterday. Yeah, but did you feel the causal for them? Or did you just face the fear intellectually? No, I only faced it intellectually. Yeah, <coughs> and this is what we often do in a day. Mm. But what's happening now is you're getting much closer to the real issues because you're actually facing what are my fears. See, and this is why a fear list, and I'd recommend that to everyone, just make a list of all of your fears. And you know, a lot of people when they do that in some workshops that we have, um, that we've been running just recently, a lot of people say, oh, I haven't got any. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, they don't. There's people here in this audience who feel they haven't got any. Right? And you know what happens is after they start getting really, really truthful, they start realising some of them have listened. I, when I did that first, I listed 33 pages of figures. Pages? Pages, yeah. Cool. yeah. So you're going to do workshops here? <laughs> I may do. It depends on the man, right? Always. Yeah. But yeah, 33 pages of fears I had. In, um, now, now I reckon I'm down around a couple. A <laughs> couple of pages. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess, so we've talked about the person who gets hurt. Now, some of the fears that I've got are where I've hurt somebody else. Uh, yes, so they're even bigger. And I, like, you can take that further and say, well, how does a murderer deal with you know, that kind of stuff? But yeah. I just want to know, because like, I've hurt some people in my life, Yep. And I want to know how to... Is that there a similar process? Yeah, no, no. And it's a very good question. Um, there's an emotion driving it of... Guilt. Guilt? Yeah. yeah. Yep. But it's a very good question, an important question to answer. The, the, um, it depends on whether you're following the divine love path or the natural love path as to what you do. On the natural love path, with all of the things we've done to harm others, 
what we're going to have to do is experience the harm that they experienced. Mm -hmm. Follow me? Mm -hmm. So that's what's, you know, you hear the term, the law of karma. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Is that we, uh, the spirits in the celestial spheres call it the law of compensation. In that every single thing you created, you will have to compensate for. Right? So that's one way. Um, you think about it from a murderer who murdered a hundred people, point of view, or a thousand, or maybe ten thousand, or maybe six million, or maybe. Yeah, you imagine mm -hmm. the emotion that they are going to need to experience. Because every single one of those persons had emotions that they went through, pain that they went through, and all of that pain and emotion and everything will be visited on that person. It's a scary proposition, isn't it? So that's one way. So let's put that down. That's the law of compensation. And ironically, myself... Oops. Compensation. Myself and Zenko today had a discussion about this, didn't we? Yeah, that's very good. This exact thing. So, if with the law of conversation, the rules are that you have to keep on dealing, keep on dealing, keep on dealing emotionally, experience all of your emotions about what you created, and by the way, everything that you created on someone else is an automatic, exactly the same penalty on your soul in that case. So if I murdered one person, all of the pain that they experienced personally and all of the problems that all of their friends experienced dealing with that pain and all of those other things, they, they will all have to be experienced by me. Now that's the law of compensation. Does that sound quite frightening? Mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, that means every single pain you've created in your child will be experienced by you. So when we start pulling it down to even our children, we can see that all of us have quite a lot of this pain, right? So that's one way. The second way, which is a great, there's a greater law called the law of divine love. And one of the laws of divine love, right, is a law of repentance. You heard of that term? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very biblical term. Mm -hmm. Or you could call it remorse. <gasps> Who attracted that? Uh, lights out at 10 o'clock. So oh, I wonder. Is yeah. there a master no. switch? Does that mean we can't override them? Does that mean that when someone goes out that door, the yeah. sun yeah. is going to go on? I told you we <laughs> had <laughs> 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 the night. We're going to open the curtains and let some light in. I thought someone was kicking us out. How many of you are feeling tired now? Like, start to <laughs> I'll answer this one question and I think we might sort of make it the end of it if, uh, if that's convenient for everyone. <laughs> Of course, I'm happy to go all night, but uh, maybe not all night, actually. Yeah. This might need a bit of sleep. And this is a very, very important topic because uh, one, of, one of the qualities of divine love... I'll, I'll sit down and yeah. someone else can do it. <laughs> wouldn't be the first time you've been arrested anyway, would it? No. <laughs> and, so this is a very important topic, so let's, uh, let's cover it because it's yeah. important. Um, what happens uh, is that God's mercy, you've all heard the term God's grace. Yes. You've heard that term? Yeah. Grace? Yeah. Well, God's grace is actually activated by a quality in your own soul, and that is the quality of feeling remorse within yourself. So what happens is that instead of having to go through the law of compensation, if you are truly remorseful in your own soul and you actually, you actually long to God for forgiveness and you feel, you're prepared to feel all the pain of everything you've created, 
then God's love can enter you and take away the causal emotion that created the event. So this is different from um, feeling of guilt. It's a more sort of a yeah, guilt God's is, focused guilt. Guilt is a capping emotion. And if you feel guilt, it doesn't activate God's love. Guilt actually helps you do the thing again, actually. So when you feel guilty, and this is something to understand about your own self in a, in a, in a psychiatric way, I suppose you could say, or a, or a psychological way, when you allow yourself to feel guilt, you're actually paying a penalty of the law of compensation. You are not really doing this. True repentance and remorse goes deeper than guilt and goes into the grief and sorrow and pain that you created in others. And you direct that and you allow yourself to experience that and you talk to God about that. And when you do that, God's love will come and actually heal the part of you that was related to why you created that in the first place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's very important to understand that and this is how, like, spirits in a spirit world get to the sixth sphere by this law of compensation. And many of them take two or three or four thousand years to do that. But there's many spirits on the divine love path who get to the sixth sphere, the same location, but on a different path, who get there in three months. Because they allow themselves to feel these emotions. So that's giving away self-reliance and, and relying on God then, basically. That's right, and relying on God's laws, yeah. having their judgment on me and all those kind of things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the key is allowing myself to feel those emotions of repentance and remorse, mm -hmm. which are very, very hard emotions to feel because you'll feel terrible with inside of yourself. Sounds like someone's having some fun out there. Maybe we should have drawn them. Sometimes guilt and blame can go hand in hand. Feel guilty so you blame somebody else. And then which allows you to do that thing. Exactly. Yeah, and those are really, they're all emotions that we'll need to get rid of at some point. Because, and they are not repentance and remorse. Actually, feel I've been in that situation, you feel absolutely wretched. Yeah. Wretched. But and you may do for days, yeah. or even weeks. I just had quite a while until yeah. I went through it all. I, was, I couldn't put a word to it, I thought, I just yeah. feel so wretched about yeah. it all. And when you release it completely, a feeling of peace will come out. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And you'll also not, whenever somebody talks about that event again, you won't feel any feelings of guilt or shame yeah. or any of those other things. Mm -hmm. You'll know in your heart that it's all completely mm -hmm. resolved. So that's living your truth, acknowledging that, which is your truth anyway, and then working through it and bringing on a, a new truth of healing within yeah. yourself. Like when I went through this with my boys, I've got two sons, uh, 24 and 22, and um, 24 and 22 now. Um, but but um, they were 11 and 13 um, when I went through this process. And what I did was I actually sat down with my two boys and... Uh, and talk to them about all of the damage that I had felt that I'd done to them. Mm -hmm. And I cried through that process. And then for about a month afterwards, I cried as well, just feeling really, really bad. And even now, my boys are now going through emotions that I created within them way back then. Mm -hmm. right? They're still, like one's just going through a breakup of a relationship that I created in a way. Mm -hmm. Because of the emotion that caused him to get together with this girl was the emotion that I created in them when they were young. Mm. Right? So I've had to feel my part in that, in that creation. Mm. Wow. And when you allow yourself to feel it and you direct the feelings of sorrow towards God, what will happen is God's love will enter you and remove from you the cause as to why you created that. Wow. Right? Mm. And that's a very powerful process. Mm. Once the cause is removed from you, you will feel totally different. Mm -hmm. And you'll feel so totally different that you will no longer even be bothered by those situations again. You will actually, and it won't be because you're ignoring them, you'll be fully connected to them. Mm -hmm. right? So I can stand in front of you and say, I did this damage to my son. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Right? And mm -hmm. I can say I that after having dealt with all the emotion of that as well. Right, so it's about dealing with all the emotion of that and feeling repented and sorrow and remorse both to my sons but also to God who was the creator of my boys. Right? 
Mm. They're my brothers, my boys are my brothers, and God created them. We were all God's children, so therefore they are God's sons. Mm. And I was entrusted with them, and I did, and I broke that trust. Right? So I, I've directed a lot of that remorse towards God as well. And as a result of that, the divine love can enter you and actually connects to the reasons why you feel 